Construction Inspections and Life Safety, hosted by SDCI Building Inspections Group. Myself, Robert Horton, and my partner, Daniel Drewhard. Yep, I'm Daniel. I'll just introduce myself here. So Rob and I are going to be going through our building inspection process today and how it relates to life safety. And we'll have some slides at the end there on some things that you can do uh, today, both immediately and extensively to improve the safety of your home. Uh, Rob Horton is going to be leading this presentation, but I'll be monitoring the chat here. So if you have any questions, feel free to use the chat function and I'll try to answer your questions accordingly. All right, go ahead, Rob. Thanks. SDCI purpose and values. Our purpose, helping people build a safe, livable, and inclusive Seattle. Our values, equity, inclusion, learning, accountability, and stewardship. Why are building codes and inspections important to life safety? One of the best ways to safeguard our communities against natural disasters is to adopt and follow up-to-date hazard resistant building codes. Building codes are the minimum design and construction requirements to ensure safe and resilient structures. Building codes protect you from a wide range of hazards, whether it is by implementing safe wiring, fire prevention, or stronger structural integrity. When a community has up-to-date building codes in place, they are more protected against these hazards. Major environmental hazards in Seattle include earthquakes, fires, and landslides. In the study, Building Codes Saved by FEMA, an analysis shows that over a 20-year period, cities and counties with modern building codes have avoided at least $132 billion in losses from natural disasters. This is based on a comparison of jurisdictions without modern building codes. In addition to the money saved, property damage is reduced. This means that immeasurable losses are also avoided, such as the stress of temporary relocation, lost income, and community disruption. Structure fires. In 2021, there were 353,500 residential fires nationwide. The top three causes of fires in homes are cooking, heating equipment, and electrical malfunction. It can take just 30 seconds for a small flame to turn into a major blaze. In 2022, 55 home fire fatalities were reported by the news media in Washington State. Washington Seismic Zones, Cascadia Subduction Zone, potential magnitude of 9.1 as seen in the Tohoku earthquake and tsunami that hit northeastern Japan in March 2011. Seattle fought, potential magnitude of 7. The Squally earthquake in 2001 was 6.8 magnitude and 30 miles underground. South Woodby Island fault, potential of 7.5 magnitude, significantly larger than the Seattle fault. To determine if your home is on a ECA or an environmental critically critical area, visit the Seattle Public Utility DSO water and sewer map. I'll and just can... jump in there, Rob, to say that I've just plugged that. Um website there in the chat if anyone wants to access that. It's a really nice feature to put in your home address and determine if uh, your property is affected by any of these conditions here. As Pew put it there, a really good top topographical map and it tells you about the zoning of your area so you can determine if you're on an ECA or not. So I put that link in the chat if anyone wants to click into that and, and, and research that further. Yeah, and as you can see, there's quite a few areas in the city that you need to be concerned about it. So it's a good thing to go to that website and do as Daniel said. 
plug yeah, in so, so each of these are just kind of the fire, the the seismic, and then the potential landslide. These are kind of the major environmental concerns that we're looking at here in Seattle, and and we build accordingly. We build and inspect accordingly, and our codes reflect that. So, um, and the next slides we're going to go through our inspection processes to talk about how we as inspectors kind of help maintain this. So, thanks, Rob. Thank you. Inspection sequence. First, we start with, as you might guess, first ground required when there's when there is any ground disturbance. And it's as little as half a cubic yard, so it doesn't take a lot before first ground is required. The next uh, process is foundation before pouring concrete forms and reinforcement are in place. And also we will check the setback before before pouring concrete. And it's at the same time as foundation. Next is CSC or construction storm water control measures during the entire project to prevent soil erosion. Then we have structural, which is where we look at shear wall nailing, anchor bolt, or hold down placement, or any retrofit anchorage using epoxy or mechanical anchors. Next, we'll have framing. And that's done before installing insulation and after all trade permits as plumbing, electrical, mechanical are approved for a cover inspection. Also, we'll have furnace and fireplace after inst installation of unit and all connections are still visible. Then insulation before installing interior drywall. Site final, final inspection of all permanent erosion control measures, measures for the life of the project. And finally, the final building inspection. All work is completed, all life safety items in place and code compliant. All mechanical, electrical and plumbing records finalized. Verifies building is safe to occupy. First ground inspections required prior to any ground disturbance. The site inspector will discuss erosion control, geotechnical concerns, drainage, and sanitation. If tree protection is required, confirms this is in place. Crucial to any construction or project site to identify potentially dangerous and hazardous conditions. Foundation inspection occurs prior to concrete placement, crucial to structures, footing, and stability. Hardware installed to resist seismic events, hold downs, for example. Rebar and reinforcement to keep concrete stable. CSC, construction storm water control. Inspection is ongoing through the lifespan of project monitoring erosion control measures for site and sediment, procedures in compliance with CSC to ensure sediment does not migrate off-site, critical inspection for ECA, environmentally con uh, critical area, critical areas, thank you, and potential landslide areas to maintain site stability. Structural inspections. Inspection purpose is to ensure structures built to plan and resist wind and seismic events. Hold downs, shear walls, strapping, major framing connections. Just to jump so, in here, Rob. Yeah, so this one kind of relates to that earlier slide of our seismic uh, uh, construction design. So this is where we're going to be really looking at um, any, any concerns with uh, seismic stuff. So go ahead. Yep, this is a really big one because this is the you know, last chance we have to see the exterior of the building because after passing structural, we give them the okay to cover the exterior. So it's the opportunity to make sure all that OSB or plywood is nailed properly to resist the uh, racking and uh, general instability of the structure. It's the time we get to see those straps like that guy's installing there. And uh, we also check the hold downs, make sure they're on place and 
If there are any missing or misplaced, we just make a note of it so we can check it at the framing inspection. So the next inspection is framing. Inspection focuses on building life safety and occurs prior to insulation inspection. Ensures fire rated assemblies are in place, observes compliance to code to reduce spread of smoke and flame, emergency escape and rescue openings, stair safety, tempered glassware required, guardrails, fall protection, and ensures all mechanical, electrical, and plumbing has been inspected and, and approved. So this is the time that we wanna check to make sure the smoke detectors are located in the proper places that we have proper windows for egress, both to get out of the building and for a firefighter with all of his gear to get into the building to rescue incapacitated people. So it's a very important time because this is definitely not the things we wanted to, to discuss at final, because then it's hard to fix it. Uh, Seattle Energy Code discusses items such as uh, en energy conservation, insulation, and um, discusses the, the uh, value for the windows. So what we have here is if we have a man getting our insulation ready for inspection. So they'll use either fiberglass, like in this case, a blow in. Um, some people even use rock wool, which is, which is really great for sound attenuation and also draft stopping. Yeah, so even even this section here, this this also relates to life safety to some degree, um, the, especially in the framing and insulation inspection. Uh, we're looking at a lot of fire rated assemblies. We're trying to stop the spread of smoke and flame. Um, and insulation can act as that as well, particularly rock wool is good at, at, at creating those partitions. So one of the main things we look at in creating a, um, a more fire safe home is is we're trying to block the spread of smoke and flame. So we're creating tighter positions partitions in the house to do so. And uh, insulation helps with that, particularly with rock wool. Site final. Ensure site is stable, ensure site stabilization is completed, verifies on site stormwater management and permeable surfaces. So the site inspector deals a lot with drainage issues. So they want to make sure that the, the downspouts are draining to an appropriate location, not to the neighbor's yard, for example. Um, in some instances, they need to use permeable surfaces because basically they want to keep the, the rainwater on the lot. Furnace and fireplace. Ensures proper installation of gas combustion appliances. Shut off valves are readily accessible. Electric shut off readily accessible. Just proper venting and exhaust. Yes. Gas, gas furnace exhaust contains carbon monoxide, nitrogen oxides, and carbon dioxide, as well as other harmful gases. Service and filter accessibility. Fireplace chimney spark arresters. Building final confirms building is safe to be occupied. Focus on life safety of building. Ensure all mechanical, electrical, and plumbing has been inspected. The final compliance. Verify smoke and heat detectors. Finish stairs and handrails. Egress and rescue openings. And attic insulation. Yeah, so that kind of that concludes our, our things you can do to quickly improve the safety of your home. You can install smoke and carbon monoxide detectors. Make sure your handrails are to code or present at all. Guardrails for fall protection. Heat detector, which is a, a newer addition to the code. It's for detecting fires in garages. Seal gaps around openings and exterior walls and roofs. Having a fire extinguisher. Self-close garage door hinges. 
don't throw your yard waste on a hill in an ECA zone. Don't remove vegetation on a hill in an ECA zone. Install highly visible street signs and property addresses. Extensive involved improvements to the safety of your home. Seismic retrofit. Install tempered glass in place of single pane non-tempered, like wherever water is involved, like a bat, like a bathroom. Hardwire interconnected smoke carbon monoxide detectors. Hurricane clips on roof assembly. Flooding drains, stormwater control upgrades, framing upgrades, structural improvements. Install and replace exterior and interior wall coverings. Complete draft stopping inside wall assemblies. Replace old electrical wiring and panel upgrades. And this is a view of our building inspecting districts with all the different ins inspection districts and the inspector that is responsible for that area. So the last time I checked, there was 12 districts scattered all over the city. And now we are open for questions. Thank you, Rob. And looks like we've got a couple of participants here. So, yeah, so what we're doing here, we're, we're just, um, as inspectors, we are just trying to determine that the home is safe to occupy and that it's resistant to these environmental concerns and that, uh, you know, life safety is on our mind at all times. So um, if anybody has any questions, now is a good opportunity. Um, I'll be in the chat. Also, feel free to unmute your mic if you wish. And, uh, yeah, thanks for participating, everybody. So I suppose if we don't have any questions for the, the building department at this time, Heather, do you think this would be appropriate to transition to uh, the electrical team to have their presentation begin? Uh, yes, I was just going to ask the electrical inspectors if they were ready to go and if they wanted to start here in about a minute. Sure. All right, whenever you guys are ready, you can begin sharing and begin your presentation. Hey, Phil, just go ahead and start whenever you're ready. I'll leave the screen up. <clears throat> Sounds good. You, um, are you ready to roll with your slides? I've got everything set up. Yep. Okay, go ahead and share. It's sharing. Not yet. Hang on. Just a second here. Let me go back. Yeah. Content. Okay. What the heck happened? Did I just go out of the meeting? No, you're here. Okay. Something went wrong with my setup here. If you if you uh, click I... click share at the bottom of the screen next to start video, it should. Yeah, my screen just disappeared. So am I sharing now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. That's very good. Good afternoon. Welcome to the afternoon session of the electrical safety at home safety month for 2023. Thank you for joining us. Hope you enjoyed the building uh, departments information on that. We hope to present with you a informative and 
uh, interesting selection of home safety electrical. Uh, my name is Phil Romer. I'm a senior electrical inspection for SDCI. I started my career in 1975 and started working for SDCI five years ago. So along with me is Brent Otterson. Introduce yourself, Brent. Hi there, I'm Brent Otterson. I was born and raised in Seattle. I grew up in the Gig Harbor area mostly. I started in the industry in March 1988, and most of my 35 year career has been in service and maintenance electrical. I have two brothers who are electricians, and I'm a second generation electrical inspector. And I started here at SDCI in August of 2022. Thanks, Brett. So this presentation will be recorded with audio and video for your viewing later on. And if you have any questions for us as we go through this presentation, you can write them in the chat. We'll be monitoring the chat. So look for your chat icon at the bottom and uh, type right in. Closed caption is also available. You can, you can see your closed caption icon at the bottom left, and you can also choose the language that you wish to have that closed caption in. So our SDCI purposes and values, our purpose is to help people build a safe, livable, and inclusive Seattle. Our values are equity, respect, quality, integrity, and service. So I'd like to welcome you to the SDCI electrical inspections team. We have currently 24 experienced and professional electrical inspectors in the field. We have four plans examiners, four managers, and one program manager. We are all here dedicated to our core values and ready to assist you in your electrical endeavors. So do we really need to talk about electrical home safety? Is that really a big deal? Certainly, if you're watching this presentation, you would say that that is obvious and that the electrical hazards are probably one of the most common hazards people encounter through their home use or even necessarily in the construction area. So the 2019 NFPA Applied Research Department completed the following statistics during that year, that 32,620 structure fires were caused by an electrical hazard. There were 430 deaths per year attributed to those fires and 1,070 serious injuries per year. It totaled $1.3 billion per year in property damage. So electrical distribution and lightning caused the most in dollar value property loss and electrical hazards ranked third for cause of residential fires, death and injuries. And these figures do not include accidental electrical shock or electrocutions just damaged by fire. OSHA statistics from August of 10th, 2022 reported that 400 annual in-home electrocutions resulted in about 200 deaths and over 4,000 shock related injuries per year. So tell us a little something about that, Brent. Phil, I think this is an important time to uh, clarify what the difference is between a shock and an electrocution. A shock is can range anywhere from mild to severe. Generally, it causes discomfort, minor burns, or muscle ache. And a severe shock or an electrocution is a much more serious situation, as we saw in those statistics. Without immediate medical intervention, an electrocution is a fatal event. So pretty serious information we're talking about today. <clears throat> so now we'll go over the outline for our program, Electrical Safety at Home. And just so you know, this is geared mainly toward do-it-yourselfers and homeowners, the program today. So first thing we're gonna talk about is electrical safety tips for my home. And beginning with that is gonna be serious situations that might be existing right now that need immediate attention followed up by some maintenance tips. Then after that, we'll talk a little bit about planning a home wiring project and what's involved there. And then we'll answer the following questions. Do I need an electrical contractor? Do I need a permit? How do I apply for a permit? And how do I request an inspection? And time permitting, there will be opportunity to question the inspectors. 
So let's go into the first section, electrical safety tips for the home. As you can see in this cartoon caption here, Homer is experiencing the predictable results of not doing proper electrical maintenance of your home. He's getting lit up and he's probably in a lot of pain. So this first slide talks about things that you might observe that should make you immediately seek help. Bill, go ahead. Well, the, the lights dim for no reason. Uh, the receptacles or switches that are unusually hot to the touch, uh, circuit breakers that trips more than once, buzzing or crackling sound coming from any device or your electrical panel, circuit breakers that feel hot to the touch or won't reset. You have received an electrical shock from a device or an appliance. Yeah, any one of those things are really dangerous and you don't need any specialized electrical equipment or tools to observe these things. They can be done by sight, smell, touch, and feel. So just to repeat again, if any of these situations are taking place, you need immediate assistance and call a licensed electrical contractor to come and take a look. So now we're gonna move into the slides that deal with maintenance of your home. And just to make a point, commercial buildings, uh, hospitals, um, uh, dormitories, all these type of places require, it's mandated that their electrical systems are maintained on a regular basis. But the care of your home's electrical system is left up to you. So the NFPA, that's the National Fire Protective Association and the IAFF, the International Association of Firefighters and the uh, insurers have compiled lists of the things that are most likely to cause hazards in your home that lead to fire, that lead to shock, that lead to electrocution, which includes loss of life, loss of home, loss of property, or severe scarring burns. So let's take a look at some things that you can do around your house to mitigate these hazards. One thing you can do is you can replace worn or loose receptacles. And you can see the outlet in this picture has had quite a bit of use. Maybe it's the one they use most often for vacuuming. But anyway, it's got a good burn on it. Cord probably doesn't fit in tight. It needs to be replaced. And then obviously when you replace this, remember to turn the power off first. Additionally, if you have broken outlet plates, it's just as important to replace those. While the, the prongs to the receptacle may not be, uh, be able to be touched, if a child sticks his finger inside the box that doesn't have a plate, he can come into contact with energized parts. So definitely maintain those broken or defective devices. Here's another example. There's an exhaust fan that clearly has several months of lint buildup. It's very important to keep those clean and it's very easy to maintain. You just pull it down, take it to the sink, wash it with soap and water, dry it first, and then reinstall it. And the same is true for dryer vents and also some hoods. Hood fans also have uh, screens like this that can be cleaned. And really, you don't want that buildup of lint, which can cause the motor to overheat, which then could eventually lead to a fire or destroying your unit. Another thing is to um, make sure that you use the proper wattage lamps and light sockets. And that's really important, especially when you're talking about heat lamps, possibly in the bathroom. People oftentimes want to use larger lights in garages or security lighting or even their own reading lamp. But if you exceed the rating of the socket with the light bulb that you install, you run the risk of an electric fire. So always watch those things. Or better yet, switch everything out to LED. Another thing to do to prevent fires in your home is to keep free space in front of your wall heaters and electrical fireplaces. And I know in our house, you can always find dog pillows next to the fireplace because they drag them over there, um, but also clothes, blankets, pet beds, curtains, all can be commonly found in these areas. And care just needs to be taken to make sure that you're not introducing a hazard with an appliance that generates heat. Here's one of my favorite is read the instructions and how many of us unpackage something new we brought home and we throw away the instructions. It is so important that we don't do that. When you bring home a new appliance or electrical device, don't throw away the instructions. Potentially life-saving information is included in those instructions. 
And those statistics that Phil mentioned earlier about the deaths and injuries, note 10% of all home electrocutions are the result of an improperly grounded kitchen appliance. Read the instructions and do what it says. And working space. You can see in this picture, somebody has got a panel in the background. That's what the yellow arrow is pointing to behind the drill press and a whole bunch of tools. The work in space rules for electrical panels in a home are 30 inches wide, 36 inches clear in front of the panel. If this person had an emergency and had to get to a circuit breaker, time would be lost and possibly someone could be injured or a fire could spread. So keep this space clear. And the NFPA would be upset if I didn't include this slide. Regularly replace your smoke detector's batteries. And in this picture, you can see a smoke detector hanging from the ceiling. And I'll just say that if one starts to act up, replace it right away. Just don't let it hang around. And remember that smoke detectors have a lifespan of 10 years. And that's about how old this one is because this is my smoke detector and I need to take care of it. All right, that is the things to do. Now here are some things that you want to definitely not do, things to avoid to keep your safe to keep your home safe from electrical hazards that could cause a fire, a shock, or some other type of injury or loss. Do not replace AFCI, GFCI circuit breakers with standard type to avoid nuisance tripping. Find the problem or call a licensed electrician. And that can be applied to any number of things, like for example, tamper resistant receptacles. A lot of homeowners do not like them because they can be difficult to plug into. But it's very important that you do not defeat any safeties for the sake of convenience. Here's another example of definitely what not to do. Do not use extension cords in place of a permanent wiring installation. This person may have been uh, creating a home office for a homework situation, maybe during COVID. But remember, extension cords are not permitted for wiring. The conductors are too small. They're not approved for continuous use. And then look at that one outlet is powering all the devices that are plugged in. So every one of those connections is a potential cause of an electrical fire because each connection creates electrical resistance. Resistance causes heat, <clears throat> heat causes fires. All right, here's another really good slide. Do not keep electrical appliances near water. You can see this person here is enjoying a nice soak in the tub, surrounded by all of life's comforts, a blender, TV, fan, hair dryer, stereo. Really, really bad idea. You do not want to have anything within reach of a bathtub. And then remember all receptacles inside a bathroom, outside, near tubs, pools, pool, uh, pools, spas, and sinks require ground fault protection. Do not leave unused or unattended appliances plugged in. And there's two reasons for this. One of them is that iron or a curling iron or something else could tip over and it could ignite what's beneath it. Another thing is a child could come up and pull that cord and have that thing come and fall on them. And I speak from experience because when I was three, I did that. I pulled a, the cord from my mom's iron. It came down and landed on my left arm. And I, to this day, have about a three inch triangular burn on my left arm. So something I'll never forget. <laughs> Here's something you probably see quite often. Don't use multi outlet converters or power strips or appliances. And that doesn't just mean kitchen appliances that could be large tools in a garage or in your bathroom. And the danger here is you see all those plugs and you think you can use them all but they're not rated for that much current and they're not rated for continuous use. So as you can see, this is the result. And here's an example of the type of cords you don't wanna use. The, the one in the top is missing its ground prong, so it offers no ground protection. The next one down, you see a frayed cord going into the cord cap. So you have the opportunity for water to intrude, short out the, the outlet or strain the conductors. And then the bottom one down there, the outlet is skinned, the, the, the cord is skinned, and if you go to roll that up while it's plugged in, you may find the part where the energized wire is skinned and it may get you on the hand. So definitely avoid those situations as well. 
So what do you do with all this information? It's really important to take it to heart and take this information and go inspect your own house. Take a look at what's going on. See what kind of hazards you might find. Even electricians find hazards in their own homes. These two pictures are also from my house. If you could see my cursor, this is a junction box feeding my new hot water tank, and I have yet to install the flex and the wire connectors. <laughs> and next to it, that's a multi-outlet assembly at my bathroom sink with a lot of things plugged into it. So <laughs> we, um, we're not all innocent, <laughs> and we all have things to work on. So this information really is really self-evaluation. Mm -hmm. Go home and make sure you're not putting your family at risk. So that's the end of section one, home safety tips. Um, I wanted to share one other little anecdote and it's about having children and electricity. Electricity is an awesome thing to have in your house, but it's also presents risk, risk of fire, risk of shock, possible loss of property, injury, loss of life. But also it can be a hazard particularly to children. And I'll tell you that as a young person, my parents, back in the mid 70s when i was about five years old had this really cool dated 1970s lamp and right now if you saw it you'd probably just put it out out in the garbage but it had a big glass green glass bowl and a light bulb and a giant shade and when my parents redid their living room set i asked for that that light in my room because i loved it and so they did my dad set up a little table and the lamp was about two feet off the ground on this table so I could reach the knob. And then my dad did this. He said, he took the shade off the lamp, unscrewed the light bulb, and he said, never put your finger in here. And then he put his finger in there and he shocked himself, but he knew what was gonna happen. My dad was an electrician. So what do you think happened? The first time my parents left, hired a babysitter and they went out to dinner. I went <laughs> into my bedroom, took the shade off the lamp, unscrewed the light bulb and stuck my finger in there. <laughs> and I'm not saying it was just the power of suggestion. I was curious, but um, these things happen and they're pretty dangerous. So maybe think twice about having a lamp in a small child's room when they can't really understand the risks. So that's all I got to say about that. Phil, did you have anything you wanted to add about safety in the home? I, I believe you covered it pretty well there, Brent. Uh, it's certainly one of those issues that maybe isn't thought about until it happens. And I think the slide on investigating your own home is very important. Uh, it may clue you in on some, some things that are maybe happening around the house that could be prevented uh, in, from an accident or, or God forbid, anything worse. So uh, I think you covered it pretty thoroughly there. Okay, and I'll say that at least one more slide was from my house. And it was the one with the uh, panel buried behind all the stuff in the garage. But the rest was all right off the internet and different picture sources. So I got some work to do. Okay, well, let's jump into the next section. And this is something that I think homeowners particularly gonna be really excited about. I talked about this on the job this week when I met some people uh, doing inspections in their home and told them what we're gonna talk about today. And it's uh, planning a home wiring project really geared toward homeowners and it helps them to evaluate their capabilities and whether or not they're ready to tackle this by themselves or if they're gonna need help. So, you see this slide has got a picture of the brand new electrical code book. Is this what you need to go buy if you're gonna take care of an electrical project in your home? Well, notice it's got 1,138 pages, including appendixes and tables. It's a daunting task to open that up and even find something relevant to what you're doing but there is a better way. We're gonna visit linknfpa.org and we're gonna learn about planning homing, home wiring projects with NFPA and that's the National Fire Protection Association. And they've got a really great website that helps you kind of figure out if this is something that you can handle or not. So we're gonna, we're gonna take a look at that. Now, if you're at home, you're not gonna be able to follow along with this because you have to be a member of this organization, which is easy to do. Hey, Phil, could you take the screen for a minute? Uh, 
I'm having trouble sharing this. Let me go back up here. Okay, Phil, you can stop sharing. Okay, is can you see my content? Yes. Okay, so this is NFPA Direct, and it's on nfpa.org. And this is a really powerful tool for homeowners. And you can go to NFPA, and they have a free 14-day trial, which I'm not advertising. Uh, but they also offer a monthly service, and I think it's about $12. But if you're thinking about doing a home project, this is a really great uh, reference to have, and I'll show you why. So let's scroll over here to occupancy. That's where we start. And we'll go down to residential. And we'll click on that, and you're going to be amazed. So look at all these slides that pop up. Let's say that your project that you're considering is you might want to install electrical vehicle charging station inside your garage and you wanna find out if you've got capability to do it. So if you click on this, you see that it highlights a few items right here that are uh, that have specific code references. And so you can just scroll down the page and let's look at number one. And this is talking about the receptacle right here and let's see what it has to say. So it says, the receptacle outlet that feeds an electrical vehicle charging station is required to be on an individual dedicated branch circuit that doesn't have any other outlets. And then it goes on to say it requires GFI protection. So that's that's some good information. And then let's go back to the results here. I'll go back down here, sorry. And then let's take a look at number two, and that's talking about the electrical vehicle charging station itself. And it gives us a little bit of information there. So. The electrical vehicle supply equipment is required to be in an area where it can make a direct connection to the vehicle, so it can't be remote located. So, unless it's listed or marked for location, it's mounted indoors, it must be stored at a height of not less than 18 inches off the floor level, so that's useful information. And then it goes on to talk about uh, ventilation and other things. So, let's take a look at that last section there, number three, and that's dealing with the electrical panel there in the garage. Let's see what it has to say. So in this slide, it just basically says that overcurrent protection is required to be sized for continuous duty, must be not less than 125% the maximum load of the equipment, which is easy to find because it'll be on the nameplate rating. And then it'll say it also requires GSCI protection. Now in this case, those are 250 volt outlets. They don't make a 250 volt outlet with a GFI, so you would go to a circuit breaker. So that's one. One thing you could look at um, if you're a homeowner looking to take on an electrical project, but maybe you've got bigger things on your mind. Maybe you want to remodel your entire basement. So we come down here to basement and it has all of the rules for basements. And you can go down and take a look at any of these uh, toggles and they'll tell you what those code requirements are, including storage spaces and mechanical spaces in your basement. So this is a really powerful and effective tool. And let's say you want to build a ADU or a DADU with a small living space and a kitchen. Well, go to residential kitchen, electrical, and it will give you all the code references for that. So this is really, really uh, good for homeowners. It helps them in a number of ways. It helps them, first of all, to plan a project, but it also helps them to determine if they have the wherewithal to take something like this on or you know determine if they're gonna you know need to hire a contractor or something so let's say you've looked at a project and you've chose one and let's say you're gonna do a basement remodel but you aren't quite sure if you can do it yourself and you're thinking that you might need to hire a contractor phil what are some tips you have about hiring an electrical contractor Bill? Bill? Oh, yes, here I am. Hey there. So, uh, hey. When it comes to choosing an electrical contractor, uh, if you're not going to do the 
project yourself, you feel like your skill level is not at the point where you would like to undertake that, uh, it goes beyond your scope of skills, then certainly what you'd wanna do is talk to friends who have had a project done before and are, and are happy with the contractors that they have chosen. Uh, talk to your local electrical supply house. They, they would have probably a reference of people that they knew. Uh, you can also go to the state website which I posted in the, the link in the chat for the Washington State LNI contractor verification system. And what you can do is if you have several contractors that you want to choose from, you could go to that website and see their licensing, their bonding, uh, any issues they've had with um, complaints or fines or things of that nature. So it's a wonderful place to go to look. and. Uh, the contractor can help design and build and install and, and finish up a project for you that they will do their utmost to help you along your way. What else can a contractor do for them, Brent? Well, my actually the next point I was gonna talk about was whether or not you need a permit. So, Let's say that you've decided you don't want to hire a contractor and you've decided to take this project on on your own. You might ask yourself, do I need an electrical permit? I want to make some upgrades to my house. When is a permit required? A permit is not required in the following situations. When you're replacing older worn out receptacles, if you're going to replace switches or exchange switches for dimmers, if you're installing uh, retrofit LED type recess lights into standard recess cans. You can replace one type of recess light trim for another. You can replace one surface mount light for another and basically any plug-in electrical appliance or device and any other similar installation that does not require modification or extensions of the electrical circuit. Any work that requires modification or extension of existing wiring requires a permit. If you're unsure, you can reach out to SDCI, Department of Electrical Inspections, and a helpful member of our staff will be able to help you determine whether your planned project requires a permit. So let's say it requires a permit. What's next? What do you do? How do you get this started, Phil? Well, Brent, you're gonna want to go to our website to check to see how to apply for that permit. So let me, let me share my screen here and see if I can't show you the process by which that is done. Where'd my screen go? There it is right there. Okay. Hang on one second, I gotta pull up my my browser here. Let me put that in the other, other screen. There we go. There we go. Are you able to see that website there? Yep. Okay, very good. So this is the SDCI, uh, or City of Seattle, uh, service sales services portal. This is where you purchase permits. And you can see there is a long list of items with which you could choose from. We're concerning ourselves with the electrical permits. The simplest way to go about getting a permit, because you will have to do this in the very start, is to look at this register for an account. Uh, as you go through the process, it's going to ask you to register for an account to get your information put into the permit, all your pertinent information for your name, address, uh, things of that nature. So if we go here to the account registration, you'll read the information about what happens for the information that you would put in here, the privacy statement, things that you need to accept that and continue on with your registration, which takes you here to your 
account setup. So when you go to your account setup, you can put in your information, you can put in your, oh, I already exist, how about that? Oh, I didn't even know I had an account. Probably because I'm part of the city. Let's see, let's do this. I'll go here and then put my email address in there and, and do it this way. And then what we will do is put in a password. And then of course, as in most cases, it asks you to type that password in again. And to answer a security question. The security question is, what are we doing? That's our security question. What are we doing? The answer is permits. So there's a contact information here. If you click on this, the type of permit that you're getting is an individual permit. So we're not an organization, we're individuals. We wanna take, click on the individual permit and continue so that the information that we have will be inputted into the permits from the very start. So when you go to apply for your permit, this information will automatically be transposed into the permit phase that you're going to get, right? Uh, if you choose not to do this part, when you go through the registration, it'll tell you this section is required, please add a record. And so fill this, fill this in, right? With the pertinent information and continue on with your registration. Once you, once you get into the registration, it, it'll ask you the type of permits that you have, and then it will go through a session of what devices you're putting in and things of that nature. Uh, so this is, this is your place to get started. Register and fill out your, your information, and then that will help you apply for your permit. That looks good, Phil. So once you got your permit, and you've begun work, when do you get your inspections? Well, you get your inspections, once you've started your work, you wanna get your inspection at a point where you have completed a partial installation of your electrical systems, run your, run your wiring in your walls, mounted your boxes, tied your grounds together, things of like that, put your light fixtures or light boxes up, depending on what type of fixtures you're doing, uh, any type of appliances that need special circuitry, want to get those things in. Uh, if you have a panel or a sub panel that needs to be in place, that and the feeders, uh, you would start with that. That's the beginning rough in, and then you would, you would want that to be called in for a rough in or a cover inspection, so that you can put the insulation and sheetrock in the walls and, and move on to your trim out and final. So do you have uh, any anything prepared so we can see how to actually apply for that permit? Or excuse me, how to uh, request that inspection? I was looking for the records. Let's see, let me go back to my records and then I can show you on the... I can show you the back on the at the services portal. There is a my records button, and what that does, it takes you here. And what it does, the contact information that you've put in, the login. This is where you will go to get your records. You'll also notice when you go into the records that there is a button up here that says reports. And if you click on that report, when you get to your permit number that will tell you what your inspections have gotten and, and what inspections, uh, if there's any corrections, whatever the inspector notes are, things of that nature. So once you log into here, it'll, it'll take you to a place to put in the permit number and that'll show you where to file for your 
uh, inspections and also get you the reports for those that you've had. Well, that sounds easy enough, but sometimes it can be a challenge for uh, homeowners to do their first one. So they can always uh, reach out to you. I'm sure at SDCI or any of our managers are able to assist anytime if a homeowner needs to determine if they need a, a permit and then make sure they select the right one and put in all the right fees. So there's always someone available to help with that. 